Hi, everybody. This is uh, Senator John Thune. I know there are a lot of students out there who are studying in a very unique um, learning environment these days uh, at home. And I want to thank all the teachers and school officials and staff who are making it possible for our students to continue to uh, pursue their, their studies, even at a time when they can't get into the classroom. And that's why the wonder of technology really makes a huge difference. Um, I thought maybe what I would do today, I and mean, a lot of you I know have to study government, have to study history, is just uh, do a quick sort of, uh, if you will, tutorial on how the U.S. Congress works in terms of our government. Uh, let me start by saying that um, I grew up in the small town of Murdo. I don't know if any of you know where that is, but it's a town of about 500 people. And when I was growing up, my dad actually was in the school system. So he was a teacher, coach, athletic director, and drove the bus. And uh, so it wasn't anywhere I could go to get away from him. And my mom was a school librarian. So we were very much about the school and being involved in the school. And, uh, and it was great growing up in a, in a smaller community and going to a smaller school because I had the opportunity to participate in a lot of activities. I got to play all the sports, played football and basketball and ran track in the spring, baseball in the summer, uh, played tuba in the band. Any tuba players out there? We're a small but proud fraternity and uh, sang in the swing choir and just had chances to do a lot of different things. In fact, just this last summer, we celebrated my high school graduating class's 40th anniversary, or 40th, I guess you'd say reunion, maybe not anniversary. And um, our class, I think, was the largest class in the history of the school. We had 41 uh, in our class. We actually had about 25 or 26 that came back for the school reunion. So anyway, that's kind of my background, but I have great appreciation for our educators out there and for the work that gets done. I'm forever grateful for teachers, administrators, coaches who invested in me through the years and, and tried to give me the skills to be able to compete uh, when I got out into the real world. And um, I know you all are, uh, as you study right now, um, you can learn anywhere. Learning can be fun anywhere, but uh, just keep, keep learning. Don't stop. And uh, even under these unusual circumstances, keep doing the best that you can. Uh, and I can tell you it will pay off in the long term. So that said, uh, just very briefly, uh, if those, those of you who are studying government probably have studied this already, but we have three branches in our government. And uh, we have a, a legislative branch, an executive branch, and a judicial branch. So three branches of government. Um, I serve in, in South Dakota, uh, on behalf of South Dakota, in the United States Senate. And so uh, we have in our legislative branch uh, two, if you will, branches in our legislative branch a Senate and a House. It's called a bicameral system and um, designed, again, to create checks and balances. Our founders, I think, were brilliant in the way that they created the three branches, the executive, legislative, and judicial, uh, as to, so that no, no one uh, branch of government would get too much power. They believed in distributed power, not centralized power, and, uh, and I think that served the country extremely well through the years. But in the legislative branch of the government, they, they did create a bicameral system, and so we have a House and a Senate. And as I said, I serve in the Senate along with Mike Rounds. Uh, he is my colleague, the other senator from South Dakota. And Dusty Johnson uh, occupies our seat in the United States House of Representatives. The institutions are very different. They work in very different ways. Um, I served in the, in the House of Representatives before arriving to, in, the, in the Senate. And I can tell you there are significant differences in the way that the two institutions function. But just as a, by way of sort of uh, illustration, if I were to ask you um, how many United States senators there are, uh, does anybody know the answer to that question? If you said 100 United States senators, you would be correct. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I serve along with Mike Rounds. Each state has two United States senators. The House of Representatives, on the other hand, is uh, based upon population of your state. And uh, this is typically a harder question to answer when I ask people, how many members are there in the House of Representatives? And uh, because it's based on population of state, it's an odd number, but it's 435. So any of you out there who answered this question correctly, your teacher should give you an A. It's a little bit more sometimes uh, challenging one to remember. But the point about it is that every state, because of its population, um, is you know, represented in the House based upon what that population is. And in the, in the state of Texas, for example, they have somewhere on the order of 31 seats in the House. California has 54. New York has 29. And so uh, South Dakota has one. 
we have one uh, member in the house. And when I had that position years ago, I always told people that uh, whenever my leadership would say, go have a meeting with the other members of your delegation, I could have that meeting in a phone booth. It's, you know, because there's a caucus of one. Um, but uh, small but powerful, uh, I guess I would argue. But that's the House of Representatives. The Senate, as I said, has equal representation, so 100 United States senators. And in order for a bill to become a law, and that's what we do, we're considered lawmakers, and so we update, modernize laws and, and put new laws on the books sometimes. Um, you know, if you're going to do that, you have to have a, a bill that originates either in the House or the Senate, most frequently if it's a spending bill or a revenue bill in the House of Representatives. And then it has to be passed both by the House, a majority there, in the United States Senate. It has to go to the president, who leads the executive branch of our government, and um, he has to sign it into law before it can ultimately become a law. But that's how the process works. And a lot of people think that uh, it's a very, um, and it is a fairly straightforward process, but because of the way the founders designed it, they wanted the House to be the institution that was most responsive to the population, to the people. And so um, they serve two-year terms. If uh, you know, They run every two years, and they all run together. So all 435 members of the House get elected or run for re-election uh, every two years. And so they are constantly uh, out there having to campaign, having to you know, be very tuned in to what people in their individual congressional districts are thinking. And so with two-year terms, um, obviously that keeps them very very uh, tuned in. Now, the, th the other thing about the House that's important is the House does everything by basically a rules committee. And so there are rules. Uh, there are rules about, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, bills come to the floor, how much, how many amendments are allowed, uh, how much time is allowed for a debate on each amendment. All those sorts of things are governed by rules. It's a very rule-driven process. And so the majority, because they can control the rules and the rules committee, uh, pretty much can get their way. 435 members, that means 218 represents or constitutes a majority, and that's what it takes to pass a bill in the House. The founders designed the Senate very differently. Um, the Senate has always been considered to be the world's greatest deliberative body, where the, they put the, the coffee and the saucer in the House, and it's hot, and they send it to the Senate to cool it down. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, again, something that the Senate, a role that the Senate has served very well throughout our nation's history. But the Senate has not only the responsibility along with the House to make laws, we also have the power to approve and ratify treaties that we make with other countries. We have the power of confirmation. So uh, members of the judiciary, judges who are nominated by the president to serve on the, on the courts uh, have to be confirmed or rejected by the Senate as is true of all executive branch nominees. So those are two other functions that the, that the Senate uh, has in addition to its, uh, you know, the, the role that we play in making laws. But that's kind of how the, the Senate functions. But the Senate is different because the terms are longer and they're staggered. And so um, I told you that a House of Representatives term is two years in office. United States Senate is how many? Thank you. Those of you that answered six are six year terms and they are, a third of the Senate is uh, sort of reelected every two years. So you're, they're, they're staggered terms. The people argue the Senate's been in continuous session literally since uh, 1789 um, because of that uh, staggered terms and because there's continuity in the Senate. The other thing about the Senate that's important to know, and this is true uh, if you think about what a majority, I told you it takes 218, a simple majority in the House of Representatives to pass things, to pass things in the Senate because our rules are different and because the Senate was created to protect minority rights, it takes not 51, right? 51 out of 100 senators would be a simple majority. It takes 60. Uh, so a supermajority, three-fifths of the United States Senate. And what that typically means is it's much harder to pass legislation because one party very rarely has 60 votes in the United States Senate. And Today, the Republican Party, of which I'm a member, has 53 uh, seats in the United States Senate. The Democrats and two independents have 47. Um, but the, my party, the Republican Party, since the popular election of senators in 1913, since that was initiated, has never had 60 votes in the United States Senate. The Democrats have, on a few occasions, had 60 votes. But it makes it very, very hard for one party um, to you know, unilaterally move its agenda without input and support from the other party because of the 60 votes threshold, the 60 vote requirement. 
So in the United States Senate, it takes 60 votes, and um, that means that we've got to be able to work. We have to have at least, even if every Republican in the Senate today, all 53 Republicans voted for something, you'd still have to have how many? Seven Democrats to get to 60 in order for something to pass in the Senate. It's a, a higher uh, hill that the founders set, and uh, they designed it. They wanted the Senate to be a place, again, that slows things down, that becomes more deliberative, and uh, most solutions in the United States Senate, irrespective of where the, the temperature in the country is in terms of right or left, liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat, most of the solutions in the Senate are sort of found in the middle. And again, by design of our founders because of that 60 vote requirement. So that's kind of a, a thumbnail sketch, if you will, about how the House and the Senate function and operate. Uh, clearly, um, you know, it's important for our country that uh, that good people uh, get out and vote and participate. And I always tell, um, when I'm talking to high school seniors in particular who are coming of age to vote, that uh, whatever your party affiliation is, whatever your views are, uh, make sure you register to vote and make sure you vote. That's how our voice is heard in a democracy. The way that we affect change is through our vote. And I would hope that many of you out there, maybe even beyond simply voting, but look at opportunities to uh, to engage in a, in a more fulsome way in the political process. Maybe run for office someday. We need good people to run for uh, city office, county office, state office, federal office, and um, we need people to step into the arena. And if you don't feel called to run for office, help somebody uh, you know who does and who shares your views and would be a good representative uh, for uh, the things that you believe in. But it's important uh, here in South Dakota and across this country that we participate in the political process that uh, our founders handed us that is truly unique and extraordinary in all the world. Uh, it truly is the, uh, you know, the most uh, profound statement of self-government the world has ever heard and ever seen is the Declaration of Independence uh, for this great country. Now, we have a great heritage, a great history, and we need to make sure that we preserve that legacy by doing our part to continue it for future generations. And that's gonna be uh, up to you guys uh, one of these days, but I just want you to know how much I appreciate uh, the work that you're doing now under difficult circumstances to continue to challenge yourself, to, be, to, to work harder, uh, to learn more, and to prepare yourself for the world that's ahead of you. I never thought when I was growing up in Myrtle, South Dakota that I would be doing this, um, but uh, again, sometimes doors open to you. Don't be afraid to push a door open and see what's on the other side. Uh, if something, if an opportunity comes along. But look for opportunities to be engaged as good citizens. Look for opportunities to be leaders. And uh, I just want to again thank you for the opportunity to share some of those thoughts with you today. Wish you well in your studies and uh, pray along with all of you and with our state and our country that all of this will end soon, that uh, lives will be protected and that we can get back to normal where you can return to your classroom and study in a more normal environment.